Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this month's Launch Awesome AMA. I'm Steve Klein. I'm the head of the Launch Awesome community here, and today I'm joined by James Doman Pipe and Alicia Carney. So we've got a long intro because these folks are pretty prolific. Okay, so James is a senior product marketing manager at the global HR company Remote, and Alicia Carney is the head of product marketing at Loon, who helps companies connect to high quality carbon removal and use it to create climate positive customer experiences. James runs Building Momentum, which is a free newsletter that helps startup founders and marketers accelerate SaaS growth through product marketing. And Alicia runs the Finding Customer Focus newsletter, which shares tips, tricks, hard lessons, and free frameworks uh, to show you how to put the customer at the center of everything you do. And then finally, together they run the WTF is Go To Market, which is a five week course for B2B startup marketers to get the skills and confidence and tools to build a customer focused go to market strategy. That was a mouthful. And honestly, I'm jealous at how much kind of awesome stuff you guys are able to put out there. Okay, cool. So today, James and Alicia are going to be walking us through a failed major new product launch, arguably almost a bit of like a company pivot or like a relaunch, like kind of 2.0 launch of the company. And then how in the ensuing months, they were able to correct some of those mistakes and get the company back to a point where they were doing a few, a few million dollars in ARR within about a year or so of that. And then ultimately the company was acquired. So was really able to turn the ship around. Okay, but first, as a reminder, the members of the Launch Awesome community get to hear about events like this before anyone else get priority access. Launch Awesome is a Slack community for product managers and product marketers to connect and really learn from each other. There's about 300 people in the community now. And if you want to join, Jake is going to drop a link in the chat right now, and we'd love to have you join. Okay, cool. So set the scene for us. You're both working at Kayako. You haven't kind of launched this giant update yet. Maybe let's just kind of give us some context here. Tell us a bit about the company. How's it doing? How's it positioned? What kind of customer segment are you serving? All that good stuff. Yeah. So yeah, we both were working at a company called Kayako. It's a SaaS customer service software. A bit like Zendesk, a bit like help scout other companies like that. When we joined, it had been going for probably about seven or eight years before it was started by the founder in his bedroom in India and mm. about a year before we joined it was actually being started and taken seriously so the founder had moved over to London they'd you know decided that yeah we're going to make this a proper company so when we joined there were about maybe 80 employees in, in UK and India and doing relatively well the product had been mostly like a like a hosting or IT services help desk kind of product but that was not where the company wanted to be. It wasn't the vision that the founder and co-founders mm. had. But we were probably doing like five, maybe four million in ARR for that by that point, which was pretty decent. But it was very much focused on answering tickets and very repetitive IT help desk kind of approach to customer service. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Interesting. Okay. Sounds like things are going pretty good. Talk to me about the idea behind the big relaunch. Like what's, what's prompting this? Yeah, the co-founders and actually all of us put together a bit of a manifesto because we knew that customer service doesn't have to be just, you know, all about tickets. Nobody wants to be treated like a ticket number. You don't want to be passed around from team to team having to repeat yourself and all of that kind of stuff. And we knew that we didn't want to just be selling that kind of software. We need to help people to turn custom service into more of a profit center um, mm -hmm. and improve loyalty and revenue and all of that good stuff. And that was coupled at the same time with some really interesting product vision stuff around integrating all of the different channels that you might use. So, you know, email, live chat, phone, and all of that kind of stuff. But rather than it being separate tickets or separate cases, it being like one long stream of customer interactions and stuff like that, which at that time was pretty new. No one was really doing that yet. Intercom were just starting out, for example, and things like that. Gotcha. Okay. So it sounds like you guys had a lot going on. It sounds like there's a lot of product change in this relaunch. What else was kind of part of this? I think you'd mentioned we're thinking about going after a different customer segment we're really going to change up how we're positioning the company yeah tell me more about that so yeah we we basically knew that you know we wanted to build this this new product and it wasn't just a simple case of redoing what we had but completely mm -hmm. building it from scratch in a brand new way new code base new positioning new messaging new pricing completely 
going to market with a brand new product and they're basically doing business from scratch again. We had probably about 5,000 customers at that point. And one of the mistakes we made was that we were actually going to sunset the old product. That was a mistake. Mm. As soon as we got around to it, we, we knew that was a mistake. So we canceled that. But this, <laughs> this new product, we, we had a really clear idea of where we wanted to go. But I think one of the mistakes we made looking back on it was like, hoping that existed in the market as well, rather than actually doing it based on the evidence that we could see in the market. And just to add something on top of that, which was the point I was going to make, we drew a line in the sand and said, Okay, all of this kind of passive development on this new vision and new product, it's going too slowly. Let's just commit. Because we were kind of like walking the center line of like dipping a toe mm. in our market. What are we doing? And then the founders were like, okay, let's cut this. We're going we're gonna to launch this new version of Kayako. And I think while if I was a founder in their shoes, I'd probably have made the same decision. It introduced so much risk to the launch process because we were so optimized and focused on a launch day. And we, everyone across the business had to build the new product, build the positioning, do all of these things as layers, you know, overlapping. And what that did is accidentally, you know, we were more focused on hitting that deadline versus validating and, and, and creating evidence that we had the right target market. There was an underserved need in the market we were solving their specific problems and we were speaking their language. So everything that we learned through the failure of the next six months after the point of that launch date, which again, you know, we hit the deadline, everyone celebrates. We got a cool custom cake with our new logo on it. Woohoo! Yeah. But you're like, oh my God, where'd the money go? So we'll talk a little bit about this, but I think one of our first early like red flags was that we became way too focused on a ship goal and execution without consideration for the actual problems we were solving yeah Definitely. yeah yeah for sure interesting yeah and it sounds like maybe almost bit off a bit more than you can chew I, I mean relaunching like that is just a hard thing to do and it's hard to when you take on something that big to get all the parts of it right even if the core of the idea is right around like hey the product needs to really fundamentally move in this direction I mean, there's so much more around it that it's just hard to get it all right on your first go. Okay. So the day comes, everyone's stoked. You got the cake, but it seems like pr maybe pretty quickly you realize some things aren't going as planned. Talk me through like, what are the next steps? Like what kind of metrics and tracking do you have in place around this? Like how did, how did you find out, Ooh, this is not going as well as we had hoped. So one of the first things was an incredible number of bugs being discovered and bubbling up to us through customer support. So the, the product was just not ready. It was failing every couple of minutes. You know, every day there'd be an outage, there was lots of spam and stuff like that. So it was a big quality indicator as well. So that was that was really interesting to see come so quickly. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you know, because we had one day we were selling the old product, the next day we were selling the new product. Immediately, we went down from adding literally thousands a day in MRR instead to like hundreds and at some days, no revenue at all. It was pretty much just a self-service and inside sales led go-to-market model. We were still driving the same number of people to the website, um, mm -hmm. we're still doing outbound and stuff like that, but we were just seeing everything fall off a cliff. We were seeing people go to the website and look at the pricing page and just clicking away straight away. If they were still encouraged to sign up for the product, they were submitting their information, landing in the product, and then just leaving straight away. Once they'd actually, by some magic miracle, managed to go through and do some onboarding and play around with it, no one pretty much was signing up to a paid plan and converting properly. And that was really worrying because at each stage of the, the funnel, we could just see numbers going down. There was, there were no clear indicators that we had, you know, that we were doing anything right, even though, like you said, we had the core concept we knew was, you know, valid. We knew it was a thing. We knew it should be working, but, you know, we just weren't seeing that come through in the results at all. And yeah, I, I want to definitely give, I try to, I try to limit these at least per day, but I want to give James some props because everyone <laughs> knows that feeling 
of business as usual, everyone's cheery, like, you know, this kind of like a culture of, of positivity, which is good. But James was the first person who took that tension that we were all feeling where we were seeing flatlined numbers and he created space for that conversation was like, okay, something's not good here. And really shifted the whole company's focus towards, you know, triaging and figuring out how do we actually go into problem solving mode. And I think that's a really important thing because I've seen that at several startups now where, you know, numbers and performance of a business are flatlining or, you know, the NPS is in the toilet, but no one really cares because maybe no one really knows how to sound the alarm. So mm -hmm. uh, I think it takes a lot of courage to do that, especially in small teams, disrupt the status quo. But I, I think that's pretty much what saved or gave us the opportunity to turn things around. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Walk me through that. How how did you go about doing that? So there are a couple of things that we made it. We really focused on transparency a lot. Kaipo was one of the best things about the company and culture. So everything from the customer support tickets who were seeing sales feedback and all that kind of stuff was in Slack. It was visible. And you could just, you know, we had a temperature check, a pulse check on what was going on and nothing was good. So we worked with the COO to basically create a war room and this project for just, you know, three or four months, we were just on it all the day. We were doing a, a lot of customer interviews, a lot of customer research, talking basically to anyone that had signed up to the product, anyone that we could talk to and hear how they had experienced it. That was a massive part. I think in our time at Kayaka, we probably talked to, I probably talked to 500 customers at least, and at least are probably the same. We really relied on getting that, you know, we could see the quantitative results weren't great. So we knew that that wouldn't tell us anything more than we already knew. So we split instead and looked at qualitative stuff. And that was, you know, a, a, a massive driver of fixing all these different areas. And we basically found that if we boil it down to three areas, we knew that we had failed on our pricing. It just wasn't right. We knew that we hadn't got positioning right. We just, it wasn't messaging to the right people. It wasn't resonating. And when people actually got into the product, they were just confused on what to do. They had no idea what to do. It was quite funny because we were using full story. So we were just watching user sections play and they were clicking around a bit. They were going into the admin area and they were just leaving and never coming back. And so that was, you know, how do you bring those people back? It was really tricky. Yeah. So one of the first things we did with the war room sessions is to identify what, figure out what we didn't know. And that was a whole... Hmm exercise in itself of understanding beneath the surface of this trailing MRR, what do we not have a, a sense of control over? And the answer was everything or those three main things that James just listed, pricing, positioning and onboarding. But it was a whole exercise to get the right people in the room and, and figure out where those gaps were. So yeah. Yeah. Well, let's dive into this. Talk to me about the pricing stuff. What's the big update you made with pricing? How did you kind of arrive at that structure? And did you do much research around the pricing before launching? So we thought going into the launch that we had done everything perfectly. Like we worked with a consultant. They previously worked with Microsoft and other SaaS businesses, and they knew what they were doing. They had a whole all the tools, all of the templates, all of the experience to help guide us through setting pricing. We had a mm -hmm. number of different spreadsheets that broke down all the features. We had you know, done user surveys to understand what people thought about the product. We looked at all of our competitors and stuff like that. We spent ages talking about the value metric we would use, the numbers we would want to use, you know, days of conversation on the name of the, each plan as well. <laughs> Course, and we, yeah, yeah we, we launched and from the conversations we were having, we just weren't getting it right at all. What we'd actually done, so we'd ended up with a pricing structure that was really close to Zendesk, our biggest, you know, biggest competitor. And it was maybe like five or seven dollars cheaper per seat. Exactly the same, pretty much offering same or very similar breakdown of features in each of those plans. And so one of the things that we found out from, from conversations is that, you know, people just didn't see themselves reflected in the pricing mm. plans that we had. They 
found it difficult to self-select. They didn't see anything that was, you know, to differentiate themselves or differentiate us from Zendesk in those pricing. You know, if you compare Zendesk as a, you know, the monolith that it is, everyone knows what it is and how it works. It's, you know, customer service made simple, whatever their slogan was at the time. Compare that to our product, which was, you know, new, a little bit cheaper, but surely you'd go for something that's more, you know, more reliable with a bigger name. So that was probably, you know, one of the first things that we found. And, mm-hmm. you know, we definitely thought that we'd gone into that whole thing with, you know, best practices nailed and we felt confident about it, which was probably the worst part of getting it wrong. Yeah. Yeah, that's tough. It sounds like maybe it was kind of a thing that it felt like, oh, in theory, we've kind of, you know, yeah. crossed all our T's and dotted all our I's here. But when like the rubber met the road, like it just wasn't really resonating with people. So what did you, around pricing specifically, what did you do the second time around? Like what, what was the primary difference between, you know, the research and framework do you use the first time and what did you do to, yeah. So the, the biggest difference is we actually went to the market, we went to customers, we went to prospects and mm-hmm. we asked them basically how much they would be willing to pay and what features they valued. So we followed the market intelligence, I think it's now called Profit Well, workbook, ebook, framework thing. And that basically breaks down into three areas. And the first is about qualifying your personas. So, you know, how easy is it to acquire them? Then looking at what features they value. And you can do that through a feature preference analysis survey questions. And then ask them willingness to pay questions, which you can use to create a really nice chart called a Van Western Dorp analysis chart. Um, And that basically gives you a really nice set of numbers. So you can say for each persona, they prefer these specific features and they are willing to pay between this price and this price. And we basically just took that and we ended up with five separate Mm -hmm. that were ranging from free all the way up to kind of an enterprise contact us number Mm -hmm. um and each one had you know was aligned with the features that those customers told us they cared about so what we did is we we just set up survey monkey surveys and we blasted emails out to our existing customer base we worked with the partners so we asked them to send it on to their customers as well and be like hey can you you know, promote this for us, it's going to be really going to help out. We shared it on social, we shared it by email, we did paid ads towards it as well. So targeting people on LinkedIn and Twitter that were, you know, following us or in our kind of like target audience. And we probably ended up with about 200, maybe 250, 220 responses to that. So oh, well, we have yeah. quite a lot of quantitative insight from people themselves on what they would actually pay and what they actually cared about from features and that was a massive revelation because we weren't just guessing anymore we had real hard evidence it wasn't you know completely scientifically reliable but it was enough for us to go on to to make a change yeah yeah that's great and you said that's a profit well framework yeah it's literally i think it's literally called yeah the SaaS pricing framework or SaaS pricing ebook Um, Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll check that out. And we can throw a link to that in the show notes. Okay, cool. Talk to me a little bit more about positioning. And and how did you think about positioning going into this launch? So we knew that we wanted to elevate our positioning quite high. So we we followed Andy Raskin's, you know, strategic narrative design format. And that's like, you know, what's the world change? What are the enemies? What's the, you know, all the, the the new world that your customers can access and things like that. We felt quite confident about that. Again, we'd done a lot of conversations. We understood quite well what people were talking about and what they cared about. But what we did wrong is we didn't understand the different stakeholders in play in our buyer journey. Mm. And so we had done all that validation of our messaging with execs, but we had completely ignored basically the like champions the managers of people that would be coming to the website to build their shortlist and so they wanted to see Mm -hmm. tangible benefits they didn't want the aspirational messaging they wanted to see a very clear cut do this this is the feature this is the benefit the outcome you're going to get style 
So we fixed that and it was fine. It was, a, you know, a really interesting shift. Well, I fixed that. I think oh, there's a lot of work underneath that. <laughs> and one of the main distinctions there is we took a different approach in terms of the conversations and the information and the value we wanted to get out of all of those different interviews and whatever. We wanted to discover all of the different buyer personas that existed versus mm -hmm. trying to validate our own assumptions of who those people should be. Yeah. It's a really, really mm -hmm. big distinction in concept. And I'll try and say it again in a different way in case that's confusing. So let's say I, I'm like, okay, I want to sell, you know, say Kayako, a customer service software company. I'm assuming that I'm going to have to sell to a customer service manager. And then I almost project my assumptions of what that person looks like, what they care about, what tools they're using versus discovering what's actually out there. And mm -hmm. if we had done that, taken that different approach first, we wouldn't have just narrowed in and focused on execs because execs are like a final sign off on budget for the buyer process that we eventually discovered. They're not the actual person who is living and breathing in that tool, relying on that tool to hit their OKRs. Yeah. So it, it was a, the difference is don't build personas, discover what's out there. And that, that's what really was the key to unlocking us, figuring out how to write the ship and how to fix things and how to speak to those people. Interesting. Gotcha. So yeah, it sounds like kind of a very human tendency of like, I think it's these people. And then I'm going to let a confirmation bias drive yes. my way to confirming that, yes, I was yes. correct about yes. that. Exactly. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this whole thing, I think there's a, there's a really interesting question here and in something that people struggle with around kind of like narrative design and positioning and at like, what level do you talk about your company? Like, yeah it's cool to have this lofty world change positioning and narrative. But at the end of the day too, like I need to, I got to write a headline like for the hero section of my homepage and finding that balance of like, you know, marketing, like, Hey, there's been this world change. There's a new game and balancing that with, but people also need to see the functional benefits and like the actual features. How, how do you guys think about striking that balance? If I could say one thing that's a little bit cheeky, we have such good job security as product marketers with one question. Who are you talking to? Your job as a product marketer is to have the most confidence in knowing who the right person is for you to talk to. And you could build the whole website mm. for what you think sounds good or what you think an executive might sound good, but the actual make or break work is in all of this customer development and building up a sense of confidence that actually CEOs are really like third tier for us. And I'm going to know, I think what the language I used yesterday on stand up is that we're doing a huge push for user testing and user research. I'm going to be doing interviews every day. I want to indoctrinate every single person in my company at Loon with the pain of this particular persona. And that's the hard part. That's why it's, it's a very difficult thing to do is to gain confidence in something that can sometimes feel like you know, very abstract or, um, or difficult. And the, the only way that I have had success in breaking through and getting that sense of momentum and confidence in who that right buyer is, is just talking to people and diversifying the channels and the ways that you reach out to people, whether that's like James said, mm -hmm. win loss interviews or mm -hmm. using a tool like Polefish is really helpful. I just did a, a, a research project with Polefish and got like incredible data for our sales narrative in like five minutes. So that's not a sponsored plug, but I did really like it. <laughs> so yeah, I can show if you want how we pulled all of those different customer insights together and then socialize that with the whole company. Again, it's nothing if it's just me and James sitting in a corner talking about like what we heard in interviews. It really, we saw a step change in our teams being able to speak to this new, oh, sorry, I guess we're skipping the point of like how we develop that new positioning and messaging that all came from the interviews and just refining. We have some frameworks we can share maybe as a little freebie for the folks who've joined. Yeah. For seeing that top line value down to the features, down to the proof points, down to the social proof. So drawing a thread of connection between that high level value and like the actual features that they need to get the job done. So yeah, it's one of our core principles from our course is like helping people to make that connection. Yeah. 
yeah so we'll share that if it's okay i can just share my screen and show you a quick example of the actual voice of the customer report that would be incredible yeah please do cool okay so this is the actual report i don't know why these are saved in iClouds. This is from 2017. The company is unrecognizable and owned by a private equity firm who has since gutted it. So I'm comfortable sharing this. But okay. So this is literally the exact report. And what I have here on the left hand side is the email that I sent out to the entire company that gives a TLDR of what the main mm -hmm. highlights are. And this is how we drove a behavior change of customer focus in Kayako and got everyone aligned behind the messaging that was working, but also holding up a bit of a mirror to our flaws and saying, we are losing customers because of these three JIRA tickets that are you know, completely fracturing a positive customer experience that we're shooting for. So anyway, I open with a positive because it's you know, a shit sandwich. Open with a good thing. Here's a oh, nice video. Yeah. And then we go through to the win-loss reasons. So this summarizes what are the main reasons that we have won customers or lost customers and the feature requests in there. So with our new, is this too small? Can you see this okay? Yeah. Okay. New customers gave us lots of good reasons. We see pricing here is a, one of the reasons that we won. <laughs> the vision, that value. <laughs> but then we also see more functional things like the live chat tool that we had built or a highly mm -hmm. configurable help center. So we are mm -hmm. seeing a mix of people citing this kind of like vision for the future, but also I just need to get my job done. Right. And then we pull that through. So what we're what I'm trying to show you with this report is it's not just reporting on traditional performance metrics like MRR, new seats added, you know, lifetime value. It's also bringing that, contextualizing that with the customer focus and understanding what are what's actually happening on the ground. And this is how we also turn things around with the onboarding experience too, is understanding why are we winning people? What are they excited about? What are they expecting to see as soon as they create that free trial account? And similarly, what are the reasons that they're just rage quitting the whole thing? So that informed how we built, I think our onboarding flow is built with app queues, but we, under, we, were, we were building all this shiny stuff being like, look how cool these automation workflows are. Every, aren't we so smart? And really what we learned from the voice, the customer program is that people were just trying to like create their, their settings, you know, the really basic admin stuff. So we were kind of mm -hmm. cart before the course. And this mm -hmm. was the types of activities we did to get to that point. I also included for the tech folks, getting them involved with this initiative, feature requests, pain points. Like James said, we were learning from those interviews that inconsistent reliability and downtime and incomplete kind of MVP tooling were all reasons that we were losing customers. And so that helped us to know what to prioritize from a product roadmap perspective. Yep. Down to the actual like, yeah, <clears throat> Jira tickets. And here's all the different reasons that people canceled. Pulling those yeah. out of Salesforce and contextualizing that and showing the actual financial consequence of a bad customer experience. So yeah, that was it. And then every single month that would go out to the entire company. And we would usually talk about what are the ways that we're going to improve this. And this would only created more of a culture of everyone valuing the bigger picture versus just focusing on their particular silo. Yep. Yeah. I love that. I feel like so many problems in SaaS companies could be solved by just more direct interaction with customers. And I saw there's a couple spots in there where you're including quotes about why we pick this or why we're churning. And just having yeah. that human element, I think it helps so many people to kind of really connect with that. And and yeah, that's so cool. Okay, cool. The last thing that you mentioned was around the onboarding. Was wondering if you could share some more color on that. Seems like you guys had a big change in how you approached onboarding for the relaunch. Go for it, James. Yeah. So we, you know, best practices on boarding, get people to value as soon as possible, right? It's get them set up in as quick as time as you can. Did not work for us at all it was a complex product there was quite a bit of configuration customization that needs to be done so people you know we were using full story sorry yeah full story and we were able to mm -hmm. watch people log in and go straight to the admin settings and start trying to set stuff up so first of all brand new product obviously we'd spent no time at all making the admin settings look good or educational or anything was very bare bones. And that was a mistake. 
people were going in to the admin settings and expecting to see, you know, what they wanted to be told, not just like what the feature was, but like how they would use it. And so by coupling those along with the interviews that we were doing, the win-loss stuff, we found that, you know, people signing up for a free trial weren't necessarily wanting to set up at all. They just wanted to experience what the product would be like for them. They wanted to understand how far they could push it or how customizable it would be for them. They wanted to know what working in the product would feel like. So rather than focus on boarding on just, you know, here's your settings, get set up. We actually put friction into the process. So we made people mm. watch a two minute video explaining the value of the product again. We made people walk through a tool tip tour, telling them like, this is what you do. This is what you did. You know, this is where you go to make this thing happen. And that just educated people on the value of it, helped them see what working in the product would be like. And that was then setting them into that mindset to go and start setting up, start playing around properly. But, you know, dummy data and empty states and things like that, we think made a big difference to how well people understood the product and how confident they felt that it would be the right thing for them to start using. Yeah. That's a lesson that I've taken into my next companies is when we redesigned the new SaaS version of Kayako, we were all, again, this insular narrative in the company. When you're a small startup and you all like care about the product and you're like, oh, isn't it beautiful? It's so great. La, 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 la. And it was so, I don't know what the word is, but like it was, it was a huge wake up call when you watch full story sessions and, and interview people and they're like, I have no idea where to go. And you're like, oh, it's not intuitive. You don't automatically know to go to X, Y, and Z and to do all of these things. And of course not. So I'm when we're kind of trying to figure out Loon's onboarding experience now, I keep going back to like not defaulting to assumptions that people, even if it's beautiful, don't assume that people know exactly where to go to, to do the job that they need to get done. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. You interesting. You had mentioned this kind of time to value metric. I think about that a lot. And I and I wonder if that's something that makes more sense for products where you actually get value out of the product immediately. But lots yeah. of products aren't like that. Like it sounds like Kayako wasn't like that. The company I work for, Launch Notes, I don't think is like that. Like no. companies that are that have a customer facing element, there's a lot of stuff that you just need to set up and get input on from other people in your company or get sign off. I yeah, I don't know that that like time to value as as a primary goal is is the right way to think about it. And do you know what what experience within that value had the highest correlation to like delight with our new customers was what we have we used to have you close like complete and close your first conversation with a customer. So we take you to how easy and effortless it is to do this thing. And we put a little confetti animation when you would complete that conversation. And that's the reason that we won some customers, not like the fancy automation triggers that you can do and all this cool advanced stuff. It was like, oh, they're celebrating me when I close the ticket. So yeah, that's, it's always value takes many different forms is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That delight element is yeah, always yeah. a fun, a fun experience to be able to provide. Okay, cool. We're running out of time here. So I want to get to some questions from the audience. So I think Jake is going to drop some of these in chat and get them up on the screen. Cool. So Rick, customer success in PLG at Next asks, how did you find out that your product positioning, pricing, and onboarding didn't work? rather than coming to the conclusion that the product wasn't ready for the market? So we did have validation that the product was needed and necessary and wanted in the market. It was a case of, you know, right strategy, poor execution, basically. And that is difficult because you start second guessing a lot. So, so that was really interesting, but it was the conversations we were having with people. As soon as we, you know, started doing win-loss conversations, as soon as we started doing, you know, trying to talk to literally anyone that had signed up for the product, we started to learn more and more that they were really interested in the, the direction of the product and what it felt like to use and the experience the product offered. But 
you know, there were blockers, there was friction, there were obstacles in their way to, to use it, to sign up for it, to buy it and convert because of X, Y, and Z reasons. What we did is we created just a, a Slack channel and all of the feedback we were hearing from every team, sales, success, the work we were doing, anyone would go into this channel and you just start seeing patterns come up time and time again. It was, you know, these bugs were, fail- were, were you know, breaking the product. We can fix those. But, you know, if we're seeing a lot of stuff about, you know, pricing or a lot of stuff about, you know, you, you don't necessarily see, necessarily see stuff about pricing. You don't see feedback about the onboarding experience. It's just like vague, you know, this is what I didn't understand. So we approach it very much from like a, a problem, you know, like solving those problems first. And that was how we came to the, the pricing, positioning, onboarding, like, sim- like yeah, causes. Right. Yeah, interesting. It it feels like a lot of the problems maybe just kind of stem back to just really sprinting towards that date and not not just having enough time to like really talk to customers about all all these extra parts kind of around the the core product launch, the update and positioning, pricing, onboarding. Yeah. But also to just to note, like it's very easy for us to make these reflections now. But I think at the time we were having a little bit of an existential crisis. So if if you are feeling something like that. You can work your way through it and get out of it, but also it doesn't mean that it's definitely one or the other. You know, we certainly were scared when we were going through this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, I got an anonymous question. How did you build confidence with your team that the next decisions were the right ones in the wake of a failed launch? That was a really interesting question. I think, and not because this was my work, but the transparency that we tried to bring. It was a bit unprecedented across like the senior leaders we were partnering with, me and James. We were really trying to own, okay, look, hands up, this is not working. And here's why. Here's the first voice of the customer report where here's the reasons we're, so giving all of the information that we had to everyone, it got people bought in to feeling that we were all fighting this one problem as a team versus trying to point blame. But also, yeah, I think that would probably be the main thing is just consistent accountability and transparency leading with the voice customer. James? You know, we weren't just fixing things, moving on to the next problem. We were iterating on these. So, you know, we worked really close with the engineering team, the website, you know, engineers and stuff like that. We're like, you know, we don't know where our pricing is going to end up. We don't know what our onboarding is going to end up. But we think that this is the right direction based on the evidence that we've heard so far. Let's give it a try. And we just kept iterating towards that. I mean, this was a journey of like at least probably four to six months in total of getting to a point of satisfaction. And it should be said that there were some very painful decisions that were made at, at a company-wide level, like pretty much getting an entirely new sales team. Because yeah. we, James started listening to sales calls when we went into full on like war room mode, James started listening to the recordings and we're like, oh my God, like this is not acceptable. And that, you know, mm-hmm. not at all speaking to the value messaging that we had been training, like, and not just on a minor sense, like in a major, like very bad, <laughs> like objectively bad. And so we had to completely get a brand new sales team with a different mindset to how they sold value and, and rebuild from the ground up. So that was a huge change that was very painful as well. Yeah, there's, I'm probably butchering this. There's a saying that goes something like trust dies in darkness or something like that. And yeah, I've found just, just kind of showing your work along the way and just constant updates around here's how things are going. Here's what we're, here's what we're doing goes so yeah. far in terms of just garnering that that trust yeah. and respect. Okay, cool. Teddy PM at Launch Notes asks, did you find the speed and number of bugs reported via customer support to be a blessing in disguise? It seems like it could be taken as an indicator of interest in your solution. Oh, customer good. support is like the biggest gift for product marketers. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I totally agree with this, yeah. You have people telling you what they like or what they don't like or what they're struggling to do or what they thought they could do, but actually can't. And this is a good reminder. We also had what we, I guess what we call like an anti-persona. And that was the Mm. folks who kept writing into support, 
so furious at the new product because they were from the old legacy product that they had been on and mm. loved on-premise, you know, desktop solution that they had loved for eight years. And now all of a sudden they don't see themselves in the new product or messaging. And they were a lot of conversations that our support team was dealing with. So we actually created a whole persona for this person who wasn't our target audience and wasn't our target buyer, but we needed to make sure that we knew how to handle those conversations, how to try and migrate them and upsell them to the new product, or if not, how to respectfully let them go. <laughs> yeah. There's that saying of like firing your customers if they're not the right fit. I, yeah. I, I wouldn't be able to do that, but it's a difficult thing to manage. It's a, it's a tough one. And I've worked as a PM, you know, for most of my career in that you know, there's always people that are right on the periphery of having the use case that you want to solve. And you always struggle with like, oh, well, they're a paying customer. Like I want to support them, even though sometimes, you know, hey, like this is at the end of the day, like this is the, dir the direction we want to take the company and the product. And the more that we build for these, these people that aren't quite it for us or kind of acquiesce to that, the more it, the more it like muddies the product for everyone else. So it's yeah. a, yeah, that's a, can be a tough one to deal with. Cool. Rich asks, how did you take senior leaders on the journey? We were very lucky to work with a COO, Jamie, who is basically one of us. Like he is a very customer centric person. He really understood the, you know, the customer we wanted to, to go for. He was very involved in the decisions we were making and completely understood why we were doing stuff differently when we were fixing it because we didn't get it right the first time around he understood that whole thing so he was great the coo we the ceo we probably had to do a little bit more work on it was more of a technical background more thinking about well of course the product can do this or that and one of the things that i think again we did really well is just making you know, a building that that empathy for customers across the business so it wasn't just you know, a persona, but it was, you know, the customer was like, you know, this, 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 it was, it, we made it real, I think, for everybody. I yeah. remember feeling really insecure at first when I was blasting this voice, the customer report to like 150 people and being like, is anyone even reading this or whatever in the very beginning? And when that technical founder heard me complaining to James about how nobody loves me or whatever he he's like no i read this every every day like i look through every single page and see what customers are saying and so that's what we're trying to do as product marketers is almost create space and showcase the customers the voice of the customer and that does all the convincing for you it should and in, in that yep. case it worked out that way yeah yeah that's great okay i think we got a couple more here all right. What launch strategy would you recommend and why? A, a rolling thunder season of launching or one big flash in the pan launch moment? So in, um, I guess my opinion on that was, would be, it really comes back to the objective that you're trying to have mm. as a business. So I'm, I, I think I'm kind of a relatively principal first person in how we how I do product marketing so you know my I don't really use launch tiers for example I'm more thinking about like what's the outcome that we want to drive what's the experience that we want customers to have or prospects or whatever and work from there and you know at Kayako we definitely focused on this big bang launch it was all in one day where we sunset the old product we rolled out the new one you know, that was shit ton of work for two product marketers to do and a business of maybe like 120 people at max, you know, definitely should have rolled that out a bit more slowly and done, you know, more of an evolution of the product or something like that. But at other companies, you know, at Kayako, the goal was like, look, we're going to cut this. We want to get rid of the old world. We want to embrace the new world. That's the goal. At other companies, the principle is more about, you know, let's learn, let's validate, let's iterate our way towards you know, where we want to get to. And the launch is less about, you know, making big noise, but about building a relationship with customers and the experience that we want to offer and things like that. Yeah. Before you hate on my launch tiers, my, they're organized by outcome that you want to drive. So 
Someone didn't read my section of the course materials. <laughs> but we really do agree on this mindset of iterating towards success. And that's what I, I always say that you can't, you can never fail a launch if you don't put all of your eggs in one day basket. <laughs> if you launch with a mindset of the first thing I want to do and measure success with this launch is to get feedback and feed that back into the business, that's a success. And if that can improve the quality and the traction of an MVP product or hitting certain commercial metrics or hitting, seeing a few, a few points increase on an NPS measurement, a better customer experience, that's success. And iterating towards this like higher level vision, that's the way to go. So I guess to answer your question, the, the thunder one, but always to take the mindset of iterate and focus on customer feedback and that will draw you towards the right direction of success. Yeah. My non-answer for this is I feel like there's actually kind of room for both. Like you can kind of, even if you're kind of working towards, hey, we're going to throw this big customer summit in, you know, in six months. And these are like the major things we're going to launch. You can, actually, you can actually talk about them in bits and pieces. Like here's, here's a work in progress update on like what we're building and what we're thinking. And you can kind of do those along the way and still have your, hey, this is like our big kind of our big marketing moment for it. Yeah, I, I think that is iterating towards that big moment like for example we just launched a whole new dashboard at loon and so we did you know we did a big huge announcement but it was preceded by this is coming do you want to put give them give us some feedback and schedule like a beta access interview this is coming what kind of projects are you looking for and then we have this big bang with which helps to set expectations for customers especially when i was at deliveroo a lot of my go-to-market leading up to a big big bang would be setting expectations with restaurants and helping them know what to expect. Of course, that, yeah. If you have any sort of tricky launches or messaging, that that's always a, a good approach to take as well. But yeah, like James said, it comes down to the purpose of the communication, who you're talking to and what the objective is. Right. Okay, we got one last one here. David PMM at Filevine asks, how does narrative design ideally take shape in a company? Do you have certain assets and documents that are created and maintained over time to ensure distribution and consistency of the narrative? For me, I, it is the sales deck. The sales deck is the thing that, so I have like, so Alicia and I have like a, a like go-to-market playbooks that we build and that's like our single source of truth for the details. And that's what we use as a basis for adapting that narrative and that messaging and that positioning into all of the other you know documents and deliverables and stuff like that but for me the main way that we communicate narrative is through that sales deck you know narrative isn't just us telling a story but it's about us taking a prospect or a customer on that journey with us so it has to be a conversational deck it's something that you walk through you have a conversation through you have prompts that you're asking all the way through and getting them you know, persuading them, convincing them that you're working through a journey with them and bringing that on that journey. Yeah, I think narrative design is really interesting. And, you know, Mark Sandrews has done a lot of stuff about it. And I think he was on a recent Launch Notes thing as well. Mm -hmm. And Andy Raskin and, and all of that stuff. I think it's really interesting to see how different people approach it. Definitely. I, I love that it's grounded in your sales deck, I feel like. I mean, sales calls is like the number one place for you to go out and actually battle test this narrative. So having that be the, the home for it, I think makes perfect sense. It's also a more cost efficient way of testing new messaging is de developing a new deck, asking one salesperson to go out and see how this performs. If it, if it gets much traction and you have faster sales cycles, then maybe it's something you want to roll out further. The only other thing I would add, I totally agree that the sales deck is the, is the, the thing ways that I try to do almost micro education and enablement across the whole business. Again, not just sales, not just marketing, the whole business, which our backend developers are always like, what? But anyway, I create like a channel called like gong gold, where I go back and listen to gong calls and then I'll take a snippet and push it into a Slack channel. And I encourage everyone else in the business to do the same where we hear our unique value being communicated back to us. It's one of my favorite kind of qualitative proof metrics of messaging resonating. If someone can recall it and think it's their own words, well, it is their own words. Or when you, yeah, when you hear that messaging reflected back to you is huge. 
So for us at Loon, we have very particular messaging that like climate is not a cost center, it's this growth driver. So whenever I hear that, I share it in with the team and then I draw a bunch of attention to it and be like, look, they're doing it and get everyone really hyped up. Like what we're doing is working and mm -hmm. treating your internal stakeholders as internal customers is something that James and I talk about a lot. And you're trying to get them to feel that their work has this bigger purpose of the problems you're solving for real people. And so I find that really helpful in accelerating enablement or confidence speaking to that messaging outside of sales conversations. If I know this is working, it really sticks. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I love that. We have we have access to Chorus in our company and every now and again, I'll go in and watch watch a conversation. But, you know, people that work outside of sales, like, you're busy. You, I mean, you have a whole other job. It's hard to like go in and do that like primary research yourself. So having, having a place where someone can kind of help surface some of those highlights is an awesome idea. I love it. Okay. Well, cool. Yeah. I think that's all we have time for today. So I just want to say thanks so much for your time and to everyone who came and sharing your story and for everyone sharing your questions. As a reminder, these events are put on by the Launch Awesome community. Jake's going to drop a link into the chat now if you'd like to join. So we'd, we'd love to see you over there. You can come, ask questions, interact with the rest of the community. And as always, it's going to be kind of your number one place to hear about future events like this. James, Alicia, is there anything you can share around like where's, where's the best place for people to follow you guys? You can sign up for my newsletter at buildingmomentum.io. Otherwise, I'm just on LinkedIn and Twitter. And yeah, I'd love to connect with more people there. I'm, I'm online. You know, I'm on Twitter and at LinkedIn. I have a sub stack, but it's pretty dead because I'm, I work, Loon is a pretty early stage startup and I've been finding I want to focus the most on that right now. But I'd love to have a coffee chat or connect to anyone if you have more questions or anything like that. And also just want to say like really great questions as I was, as I was watching them come in, I was like, how are we going to cover all these? These are such good questions. <laughs> so yeah, thanks nice. everyone for, for all the great. Wait, yeah, great. Awesome. I'll be sure to include links to kind of all those things in the wrap up email. Alrighty. Well, cool. Thanks so much everyone. And we'll see you next time.